Caparro. Per fortuna tu di Caparro avevi versato poco, che sono 4.000. Vedi un pochino tu, se... e qua purtroppo non, non si capisce più niente. E tu dici di Domenico che sta andando fuori di testa, ma qua veramente è da andare fuori di testa, ma ci rendiamo conto questa farsa, come la stanno, come la stanno gonfiando? Qui ci porteranno alla, alla distruzione totale delle economie se continuano, se veramente dicono di fare una cazzata. All right, here we are. Now, um, last week we uh, uh, read together chapter one. And uh, now is the turn of chapter two. Uh, okay, so I hope you have had the opportunity to take a look at uh, my translation. Now, before I go into uh, today's topic, which is chapter two and the analysis of chapter two, uh, do you have any question? No? Some of you have sent me uh, emails or messages. I think it's good that the questions you have are posed publicly so that every, everybody can benefit out of uh, other people's doubts. So anybody? Okay, then let's go into chapter two and possibly even chapter three. Now, as I told you uh, last week, chapter two, three and four form a thematic unity, unit, sorry. Uh, that is to say, in them, Plotinus um, investigates the relation that uh, obtains, that holds, sorry, the, the relation that holds uh, between, uh, give me a second. I was telling you, um, in chapter two, three, and four, Plotinus mm -hmm. focuses on uh, one particular aspect of reality, which in Greek he calls physis, and which I have translated as power of growth. There is a reason why I've translated uh, this word thesis with power of growth, which I will clarify later on. For the moment, what I want to focus on is uh, to um, uh, make clear to you that the focus of these three chapters, namely two, three, and four, is that of investigating the relation that holds between this reality, thesis, the power of growth, and uh, the act of vision, i.e. theoria in Greek. Uh, the power of growth itself, Plotinus concludes, is an ethos and a logos, and being ethos slash logos, it is a form of act of vision. In fact, in these three chapters, it emerges already very clearly that anything that is, anything that exists, insofar as it exists um, as something, is act of vision, is the result, result of an act of vision, and is an act of vision itself. Now, let's go into chapter two. Let's clarify first the term thesis. We already started doing that uh, last week. Uh, and I told you that the word 
this is, is a key word of Greek thought. Uh, one of the most typical key words of Greek thought. In fact, one could even say that together with logos is the first word of Greek thought. You find it, for example, in the vocabulary of the so-called pre-Socratic thinkers, people like Heraclitus or Parmenides or Anaxagoras or Thales, uh, all these people who wrote books or poems, uh, the title of which was Perifiseos, on thesis. What does this word mean? As I told you last week, uh, we tend to translate this word thesis with the word nature, but the word nature in itself is ambiguous uh, because the word nature in our usage of it can mean uh, desperate, disparate things such as uh, someone's character or, or uh, things external to the human being, things that do not depend on the acting of the human being, on the making of the human being, but exist independent of us, such as trees, stars, stones, other living things, and life in general. And this is uh, a rather naive understanding of nature. And then there is the more technical understanding of nature, which is the one which uh, inadvertently, but very deeply, uh, we tend to have in mind when we use this word, uh, according to which nature is the ensemble of those uh, physical laws uh, organized according to geometric or mathematical principles that make what we call reality. Now, the ancient Greeks above all the first thinkers of ancient Greece, didn't have uh, these notions in mind when they said, when they used the word thesis. The word thesis per se is, one could say, a philosophical coinage. In fact, as a word, is not found in Homer or in Hesiod. That is to say, it's not found in the first uh, witnesses of the Greek language. Now, you may know, or if you don't know, you can go look it up, uh, who Homer and Hesiod uh, were. Uh, they are the, the two uh, first epic poets of the uh, of Greek tradition, and they represent probably the 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 most two ancient uh, poetical examples uh, of historical time. Give me a second, guys. Maybe feed him because like this I cannot go. Sorry, eh? There's my dog who's, uh, who's uh, asking for food. Okay. So the word feces, uh, as such, didn't exist basically before the pre-Socratic philosophers, philosophers or better, the pre-Socratic thinkers started using it. This word, thesis, is the substantivization, that is to say, the making into a substantive of the verb theo. Theo in Greek means more or less to grow, to, uh, to unfold by itself in growth. So for example, I can say that uh, a tree, fee, that is to say a tree grows, but also a human being grows. So anything that lives grows. In archaic Greek, this verb in the perfect tense is also used to mean the way in which one is. So uh, 
what in English we say it is in his nature to do this or that, in Greek he said, pefike, blah, 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 doing, right? So it is in one's nature to manifest him or herself or itself in a certain way. When the first thinkers uh, started using the word thesis, what they meant was the fact that things uh, manifested themselves as the ability to come to presence, that is to say, to make themselves present, as the ability to appear. So what is thesis then? Is not nature in the sense of the things that are out there and are independent of us. Thesis denotes instead this inner power of self-sustenance that uh, keeps things up. And thanks to which things appear as things. That's what thesis is originally, okay? And in this sense, this is still the sense that, that the meaning that Aristotle has in mind when he writes about thesis in book two of a collection of treatise, treatises called Peri ton Physicon on things that relate to thesis. What is then thesis, long story short? Is this inner power that we could say now animates everything that is. Everything that is, is insofar as it manifests itself as the coming forth of this inner power. The question then becomes, what is this inner power precisely, as you can understand, right? That's what the question becomes. The one who has posed this question explicitly the first one who has posed this question in the most explicit terms is Aristotle, as I told you in book two of uh, the collection of his treatises that goes under the title Physics. Plotinus takes up from where Aristotle had left. In the meanwhile though, between Plotinus and Aristotle, Philosophical and religious speculation had, take, take pla had taken place. And uh, uh, it had taken place giving a certain answer to the question regarding what this power of growth precisely is. How does it work precisely? One thing that I want you to have clearly in mind is that in this chapter and in the, in the two chapters that are connected to it, so in two, three, and four, Plotinus uses the word thesis intending mostly the power of growth. There are certain moments though in which Plotinus uses the word thesis, meaning with that word, the, what, I, what I translated the, as the manifestivity of things, okay? What is the difference? The difference stands in the fact that uh, the power of growth, thesis understood as power of growth, is something that pertains to things that live in the sense of vegetation. So our body, for example or the plants, or other living creatures down here. Whereas, 
this is understood as manifestivity pertains to anything that lives. The difference though is the kind of living. The soul understood as separate from the body, it is life indeed, but it's not first and foremost vegetative life. Yet being life, it manifests itself in a way. It is a manifestivity. It shows itself, right? So Plotinus uses the word thesis in these two acceptations. On the one hand, as power of growth. Hence, as manifestivity understood primarily in the sense of vegetation. Life understood as vegetative power. On the other, he uses the word thesis in the sense of manifestivity. So, the coming into presence of things as things. Hence, life understood as the coming forth into presence. Okay? All right. Now, let's go back to what I was telling you before, namely that between Aristotle and Plotinus, certain ways of understanding what this power of growth precisely is and how it works were put forth. In chapter two, Plotinus refers to these ways. And uh, what he says about these ways represents for us a historical philological problem because we don't know what he precisely has in mind. In other words, is he thinking of Stoic doctrines? Is he thinking of Christian slash Gnostic doctrines? We don't know precisely. It seems that he's conflating the two to a certain extent. Uh, for what does he say? On the one hand, at the beginning of chapter two, he holds that he says that there are people, he says that there are people who uh, think of the making typical of the power of growth in terms of pushing, thrusting, and generally speaking, exercising some kind of mechanical pressure, mechanical uh, work on a material. And he says that these people think of it in term making a, a similitude with the kind of operation typical of artisanal working. What does an artisan do? An artisan shapes a material by applying pressure on it, right? So think of a sculptor. A sculptor, think of a uh, wax shaper or a mud shaper, which are the examples that Plotinus himself brings. Now, we can ask, who are those who think of the production or the productivity of the making typical of the power of growth in these terms? It seems that uh, the easiest target Plotinus might have had in mind would have been the Christians and the Gnostics. In fact, in the Bible, the making of uh, the human being by God and the making of other things by God in the second account of creation is thought of in terms of wax modeling or mud modeling. So Plotinus is saying, is attacking the uh, Gnostic Christian way of understanding how the power of growth makes. However, in this same chapter, Plotinus um, makes a covert reference uh, to Stoic doctrines. How do we know that? Because of a certain vocabulary that Plotinus uses. At the end of chapter one, Plotinus says, there are people who would say that the power of growth can have, nothing to, can, can have nothing to do with the act of vision because the power of growth is aphandastos, that is to say, doesn't have 
the faculty of imagination. And if it doesn't have the faculty of imagination, how can it be equated or assimilated in any way to an act of vision? Who are these people who said that thesis is a fandastos? This expression, a fandastos thesis, is found in Stoic fragments. Now, I cannot uh, here make a digression and tell you who the Stoics were. Uh, I suggest you do, uh, you, you, you uh, inform yourself by doing some research online. Uh, in any case, the only thing that I can tell you here is that the Stoics uh, were a philosophical school that flourished starting from the first century AD, uh, BC, sorry, more or less, and uh, stretched down to the time of Plotinus. They've had a huge influence even on the development of Christian thought. So um, Plotinus is attacking both the Stoics and the Christians. And what is it that he finds uh, questionable in the Stoic understanding of the making typical of the power of growth? The fact that according to the Stoics, the power of growth or thesis can be divided into two parts. One is the aphandastos thesis, which uh, would correspond to the uh, various natural phenomena that we see down here. Behind this kind of thesis, the aphandastos, mm -hmm. the, 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 the power of growth bereft of uh, the faculty of imagination, there will be what the Stoics call the noera thesis or intellectual or intellective uh, thesis, uh, which is basically the logos. So for the Stoics, thesis is divided between an active power and a passive power. The problem for Plotinus is how are these two things connected? And how does the active power exercise its action on the passive power? The Stoics, it seems to Plotinus, don't explain this. Uh, or if one goes look uh, more carefully and peruses what the Stoics think, Plotinus concludes, uh, it seems that the Stoics think of the interaction between these two parts as characterized by some kind of mechanicism. And that's what Plotinus finds objectionable also in the Stoics' uh, view of thesis. In other words, for him, the Stoics' view of thesis, on the one hand, breaks uh, thesis up into two parts. And then it fails to explain how these two parts interact introducing some kind of mechanistic understanding of the working of thesis. The problem for Plotinus is that by doing so, the Stoics and the Christians even more, uh, fail to account for the continuity of life. Life for Plotinus manifests itself as a continuous, as a continuum, sorry. And the, the, the task of thought is that of understanding how this continuum holds itself up as a continuum. So in other words, for Plotinus, any thought that were to introduce, <coughs> were to introduce breaks is a thought that fails to understand life, to understand the working of life. And that's chapter two. So in chapter two, to sum things up, what is it that Plotinus does? He presents on the one hand, the Gnostic Christian view and the Stoic view on how the power of growth works. He refuses it and he refuses it, accusing both of introducing a break between uh, two different parts of the power of growth and thus 
failing to grasp the continuity of life as a productive phenomenon. Okay, that's what it does in chapter two. Is it clear? Good. Now, the important thing, okay, let me open a parenthesis here. Uh, what I just told you is a summary, a clumsy one probably, of what you can find in, uh, uh, in the commentary on chapter two. Okay, so go read that commentary carefully. As I told you, one big problem in chapter two is a philological problem. A problem that doesn't need to worry us now. By philological, I mean a problem that has to do with the question, who is Plotinus precisely thinking of? Okay. To my mind, we can only guess who is thinking of. But the kind of thought that is attacking is clear is attacking a thought that understands the unfolding of life as the working of some kind of mechanism or other. Okay? Um, now that we have understood what Plotinus is doing in chapter two. Let's stress uh, one point that already emerges clearly in chapter two, the concept, the notion of life, the notion of life. Zoe, in Greek, life is Zoe. I'll write it down so that you have it. Now, the Greeks, or in Greek, you have two words to talk about life. One is zoe, and the other one is bios. I'm writing it down. In Greek, you have these two terms to talk about life. Do they say the same thing? No, they talk about two different things. Zoe is life understood as the all animating principle. Anything that lives, lives because of Zoe. Animals, for example, in Greek are called Zoa. Mm. Ta zoa. Uh, psyche that Jonathan is referring to, psyche is life in its clearest manifestivity. Psyche and life in Greek thought are coextensive. Zoe and psyche are coextensive. Okay. If you say zoe, you're saying psyche, and vice versa. Coextensive means that they, they mean the same, that they, they map on each other, okay? Guys, by the way, I'm, no, I'm noticing more and more, not only with you, but also with your colleagues, that you lack the, the knowledge of basic Greek terms, uh, basic English terms, English terms. So. I understand if someone who comes from China doesn't know what coextensive is, but someone who has grown up in damn Singapore should know what coextensive is, okay? Now, why is this? Because you don't read enough. You must read. 
the word coextensive is not a technically philosophical word or a or an abstruse word. It's a word that you find normally. Coextensive means that the two things map on each other. Okay. It can be said of I don't know. Uh, uh, my, my towel ex is coextensive to yours, meaning that we can overlap them precisely, okay? And they coincide precisely. Okay, uh, so do read more. Mm. And when you don't know a word, go look it up on the English dictionary and memorize it. Uh, okay. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah. So zoe and psychi are coextensive. They mean the same thing. So much so that in the Fido, Plato can say that psychi is immortal because psychi is life itself. And since life is the opposite of death, psychi cannot die. Mm. What is bios then? Bios is another thing. Bios uh, is life uh, understood as uh, typical of the human being. Bios is, in other words, the way in which the human being can lead his life. Sorry, baby. Try to, to calm him down. Sorry, guys, these are the, uh, the problems of uh, having to, uh, to do stuff from home. For all those who want us to, uh, to convince that we can uh, keep uh, living our vios, as the Greeks would say, from home, this is just a tiny, a tiny example of how that is impossible. Because a dog doesn't listen to reason. A dog whines and that's it. So good luck making a dog understand that it shouldn't whine while there is class. In any case, what is Vios? Vios is life as led by a human being. Only a human being has life. As, as Vios, sorry. Only a human being has Vios. My dog has Zoe. I have Zoe. But my dog doesn't have Vios. My dog has only Zoe. Whereas... I have also Vios. And what is Vios? Vios is a certain way to lead life. Okay? That's why, even in English, we talk about biography. And speaking in strictly uh, Greek perspective, the word biology is a nonsense. In Greek perspective, they should be called zoology, not biology. Okay? Why? Because bios is only typical of the human being, is the way in which a human being has its zoe. Okay? All right. So the concept of zoe is larger than the concept of Vios. And the concept of Vios specifies a certain way in which Zoe can unfold. Is it clear? All right. I told you that in this chapter, what emerges is a preoccupation regarding Zoe, regarding life. This is a key point to understand Plotinus' thought. Plotinus is interest in understanding how life works, what life precisely is. He already knows something. He knows that life manifests itself every time in as many easy or logi. 
What is EDOS and LOGOS? We already explained. EDOS is a thing in, in so far as it is a thing. So a chair is an ethos, a dog is an ethos, depending on a higher ethos. And ethos and logos are two words to talk about the same thing from different perspectives. So the central question that animates Plotinus, one of the central questions that animates, that animate Plotinus's thought is the question regarding life what life precisely is. Now, this question <laughs> is a question that is still with us. Modern physics tries to explain the phenomenon of life as the unfolding of some kind of energy. An energy is understood as the activity exercised on a mass at least in classical physics. Biology, modern biology, also tries to understand the phenomenon of life. And in the way in which he does so, in many, in many ways, is in contrast with physics and with chemistry. So the phenomenon of life, when you think about it, remains, even today, a problem. What is life precisely? How do things emerge as things and how do they stay as things? How do they stay into existence? One thing regarding the direction of Plotinus' thought we already know, namely that he thinks the phenomenon of life in terms of making or productivity. And we know that already from chapter one, in which the word pieces, making, or praxis, which for Plotinus is, is coextensive with pieces, already appears, and it appears not in opposition to, but in parallel with the act of vision. So that's an important point on which we have to stop already and reflect. The problem of life. And life is understood in its unfolding in terms of a making or productivity. The question then becomes, how does this making or productivity work? In chapter two, as I was telling you at the beginning of class, Plotinus already rolls out completely the stoico slash Christian understanding that comprehends this making, that understands this making and this productivity in terms of mechanism. Okay? In chapter three and four, he will go on to explain, to start introducing his understanding of life as productivity. But let me repeat, the important thing here to understand is that at the end of chapter two, already something important has emerged. Something that is important not only for this treatise, but to understand the entirety of Plotinus' thought and in many ways to understand uh, an important trait of the entire unfolding of Western thought, the problem of life. What is life? Life is surely a kind of making. What kind of making? How does life make? Okay, that's the question. If you don't understand this, you won't be able to follow what Plotinus does. One thing is sure, namely that we have to reject, Plotinus says, all those expl explanations of the making typical of life, which invoke 
notions of mechanism. Those are inadequate to understand what kind of making belongs to life. Okay? And that's chapter two. Now, uh, I will stop here for today because I think it's already a lot. But before I stop, I stop here. And, uh, and uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll take care of a question that uh, Young Chun is asking. So biology is nonsense because biology is used for animals as well. You should instead be, yeah, exactly. The word biology, uh, from an, an etymological point of view, makes no sense. Biology, uh, taken uh, literally, means the study of the way in which human beings lead life. Because the bios is something that belongs only to the human being. Zoology, instead, should be the term to refer to what biology does. Okay? So a biologist, in reality, should be called a zoologist. That is to say, someone who studies life understood in its larger uh, notion, okay? Now, uh, to explore, uh, William, to explore this. Biography, written account of a human life. Yeah, the biography is a written account of a human life, and it's called biography uh, precisely because the bios belongs to the human being. Nobody can write the biography of, of a dog, right? The dog has no bios. To give you an example, if you read the life of saints, of Christian saints, a literary genre that was invented uh, at the end of antiquity, and it was invented by Greek monks. Uh, well, the, the title of a life of a saint is always Vios que politia to blah, 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 blah. The life led in the manner in which he led it of such and such. Okay, so Bios is something that belongs only to us, not to the animals. Then Yun Chung, there is also the understanding of philosophy as a way of life. So this understanding of philosophy should actually be the biology instead. Yeah, in a way, yes, yes, that's a good point, uh, Yun Chung. Uh, that uh, philosophy is a way of life. In that sense, philosophy is a biology, okay? It's a way of understanding how one can lead or should lead his, her life. Uh, now, uh, Joel, as a, as a question, I see he has raised his hand. Yeah, bro. Um, at the start, you raised that one problematic notion that Afantos and Noera um, thesis, right, this split introduces, is yeah. that it's a mechanistic explanation. Yeah. So first off, by mechanistic, you mean referring to deterministic of described by physical... Mm. Like, yeah. Right? So yeah. I don't quite understand why the splitting up of um, yeah. the power of growth would imply that it's mechanistic. Yeah, I mean, uh, Plotinus uh, explains that in a very short and in a way obscure passage of chapter two, which if you read the commentary, I've tried to elucidate. Uh, what Plotinus says is pretty much this. If you split thesis into two, right? One becomes the principled, namely the Aphantastos thesis, and the other one becomes the principle, namely the Noera thesis. Okay. What's the relation between these two? The Stoics seem to think that the Noera thesis, being inside the Aphantastos thesis, somehow pushes it, moves it. So the relation is one between the mover and the moved. But how does this being moved happen? Through some kind of pushing? Through some kind of thrusting? It seems so for the Stoics. Why? Because for the Stoics, both these principles are material. If they're both material, 
as I say, if they're both stuffy, made out of stuff, right? And then it means that some kind of pressure must take place on the one hand. And if we agree on that, and if we agree that the relation is one between the contained, which is the mover, and the container, which is the moved, right? The noera is the mover and the aphantastos is the moved, right? Then we're saying that there is a physical material just position which through which one of the two is set in motion by the other through some kind of pushing, right? But at that point, we can't say that the mover is unmoved as the Stoics do. Because if it is contained by the moved, then it must be, uh, I would say, uh, it must be, um, well, uh, now the adjective doesn't come, it must also be motion, right? Think of this. If you are in a car and this car move, are you moving? Yes, of course. You are moving with the car. So can you be said to be unmoved? No. Then the Stoics even contradict themselves because they postulate that the noera thesis is the unmoved logos. But if the unmoved logos is material and is contained in another material thing, and this other material thing is moved through some kind of pushing exercised by the supposedly unmoved thing, the unmoved thing, thing being contained by the moved thing, it must be in motion as well, right? So that's why Plotinus can attack the Stoics because he finds certain inconsistencies on what the Stoics, in what the Stoics say, say. Now, here I must give you a warning though. First of all, regarding the Stoics, we have only fragments, okay? We have only fragments that have been collected by putting together references made by different authors to Stoic doctrines. The authors that give us most references to Stoic doctrines are Plutarch, Plutarch the Elder, Cicero, Seneca, of course, who was a Stoic himself, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, who was a Stoic himself. But when it comes to uh, the most complex doctrines of the Stoics, which were laid down by people like uh, Zeno of Sisychus, or uh, what's his name, Cleanthes and, uh, and, and all the singing orchestra, we have only fragments. So when it comes to Stoics physics, we have to rely on what other authors tell us. So our knowledge of Stoic doctrines is indirect. That's the first caveat. The second caveat is that what we're dealing here as Stoic is in reality the interpretation that Plotinus gives of what probably were Stoic doctrines. So I'm not saying that the Stoics actually said that. I'm saying that Plotinus reads the Stoics as if they were saying that. I want to uh, make this clear because in an epistolar exchange with, uh, with another scholar, uh, this scholar, who's one of the main experts on Stoicism, kept banging on the point that, yeah, but Plotinus is wrong, but Plotinus is wrong. Yeah, he might be wrong. Uh, that's not the point here. He might be wrong when it comes to understanding Stoicism. That's not the point. The point is that he sees in the Stoics and in the doctrines an understanding of the working of nature based on some kind of mechanicism, which he rejects. His problem being understanding the unfolding of life as a continuum, okay? I hope this clarified your question. So I wouldn't say that the, the, the notion is that of determinism, but for sure that of mechanicism that Plotinus goes against. If I can check my understanding, it's that mm -hmm. um, 
things have a power of growth, mm-hmm. according to the Stoics, because it is inhabited by either Aphantastos feces. No, the Aphantastos the Aphantastos feces, feces is what is inhabited by the Noera feces. Okay. And it mm-hmm. grows, it moves, because it's moved by the Noera feces. Okay. And these both manifest themselves in things. Yeah. Yeah, so for example, if you see a tree, right? This tree is the Aphantastos feces. Okay. And why does this tree grow and move? I mean, move because it, you know, it grows up, it, it, it develops branches and so on and so forth. Because it's moved inside by a principle that is contained inside it, which the Stoics said is unmoved per se as principle. The objections that Plotinus raises are the ones that I already told you. Namely, what's the connection between these two things? How does this, uh, uh, this influence of one on the other happen? And uh, if the unmoved is in the moved, physically, materially, then also the unmoved is in motion. Hence, you cannot call it unmoved, right? These are the objection, objections that Plotinus uh, sends against the Stoics. By the way, this Stoic doctrine is at the basis, in many ways, of modern physics. By modern physics, I refer specifically to the physical the, the revolution in physics of the 1600s, the first scientific revolution. And uh, it is crystallized in, uh, in a notion that Spinoza has reshaped using scholastic terms, namely the, the distinction between natura naturans and natura naturata. Nature that natures and nature that is natured. Okay. Let me write it down, and then you can check it up on uh, Wikipedia. Natura, naturans versus natura, naturata, naturata, naturata. Yes, you can go check it up on uh, online. You'll find stuff on this. Okay. Last thing to check. So, Noera thesis is not something that is exclusive to humans. Instead, everything that has the power of growth has both Aphantastos and then within it, Noera. Yeah, according to the, phys- to the Stoics, yes. I mean, if you divide things, yeah. uh, but uh, for the Greeks in general, anything that lives uh, is species. But feces manifests itself also in things that do not live, like stones, mountains, uh, and all the rest that we call today inorganic. Okay. Now, William says, uh, wait, no, first there is, uh, um, women, uh, was it a coincidence? that the Stoic idea of making was similar to that of the Gnostic Christian idea, or did they arise separately? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, oh, they, they arose separately because the Stoic understanding of thesis, uh, the Stoic understanding of uh, thesis, yeah, correct, uh, and of making uh, precedes that of the, of the Christians, even just chronologically. Uh, now, the question is, why is Plotinus conflating them here together? I think because he sees in them both at work the notion of mechanicism, which he wants to reject. That's uh, why he conflates them. Um, But as I told you, in many ways, uh, Stoicism and Christianity, at least in the first centuries of Christianity, before Christianity got Platonized more and more. Stoicism and Christianity rubbed uh, itself, uh, rubbed themselves against each other. You can find that even in, uh, in the letters of St. Paul, there are hints at the fact that Paul 
is thinking in certain ways in stoic terms. If you want to go deeper in this, there is a book by a great uh, German philologist of the past century, Edward Norden, Edward Norden, the title of which is, sorry, the title of which is Agnostos Theos. You can go check this book out. If it, I don't know if it has been translated in English. Originally, it's in German. Uh, it should have been translated. In any case, in this book, Northern uh, is a thick book. Uh, signals all the passages which show how many Christian doctrines are coextensive with Stoic doctrines. So when Plotinus conflates them together, he's not doing something, I don't think, arbitrarily or that he alone does. He's probably doing something that he knew many people would recognize as legitimate, conflating Stoicism with Christianity in terms of basic doctrines okay then uh, william could you elaborate on what you meant when you said that life is a continuum well uh, continuum means that there is no observable break right uh, life can be understood as it has been understood by even recent philosophers, for example, Bergson, as a flowing, as a constant flowing. If you reflect on one thing, namely that life never stops. There is no stopping of life. And there is no moment in which we can say that life began. Any, any attempt to indicate the beginning of life is a failure. Or, if you, will, if you don't want to use the, the strong word failure, is a very dairy, uh, daring uh, supposition, hypothesis. Life flows, right? And it flows as a continuum. So continuum is something, something that is in a continuum, something that manifests itself as a continuum, is something that has no breaks, something that uh, is not the result of joining different portions, but appears as a whole, right? So, now, so the, holistic the, the holistic nature of life, I think, is one of the most apparent things that one can think of, right? if the seed becomes a plant, is because there is this living flow. Let's call it this way. Now, the question is, how does this work? Through some kind of mechanism? Plotinus says, no, it, it cannot be a mechanism, because mechanism implies pushing, thrusting, exercising pressure, and where do you see that? Okay? Any other question? So this is talking exclusively about like life, like plants, um, animals. Does it? Are you saying that the continuum? It's not. It's not to say that there is no break between uh, stone and bacteria. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, of course there is a break there, right? Okay. And Plotinus will investigate also that. Mm. Plotinus will investigate also what that mm. break is. Mm. But when it comes to life as a general observable phenomenon, there is no break in it. So much so that if you think of it, even this coronavirus thing, uh, 
is something that comes from other living things. Mm. And it affects us because we live. It doesn't affect what doesn't live. So, uh, even this shows to you the fact that there is a connectivity in life. Mm. And that life, as an observable phenomenon, unfolds as something continuum. Mm. Then, of course, we can cut distinctions in it, but the distinctions are posterior to the phenomenon itself. Okay. Now I have two of you who raised their hands. Who are they? Uh, I can I go first? Uh, yeah. Yes, sure. Prof. So last week you mentioned about the uh, Plotinus first ground. First? So, uh, the foundation of his whole notion. His first ground. Mm. Yeah, so could you just give me a hint? What is his first ground? Because right now he only counter what the others have said, but he did not propose what he thinks life is. I mean, he's, he's uh, throwing the problem. We have to stay with the problem first. We have to make sure that we understand the problem. He will explain that as he goes on. Uh, I mean, that's what I told you guys last week. Unfortunately, you are used to already run to a definition and then stay with it. But that's not the point. The point is to understand the, the question to which any definition is an answer. So in order to reach a possible definition, which when it is generally reached, stands always as a hypothesis, we must understand, first of all, the question and the terms of the question. So far, we gained already a positive datum, namely that Plotinus rejects any notion of mechanism when it comes to life and the working of life. And on the other hand, he does understand uh, life as some kind of making. The question is, what kind of making? Okay. The other positive thing that we reached is that Plotinus sees life as manifesting itself in easy. And each ethos is a thing. Okay? So the question is, how does each thing, each ethos, subsist? What is the kind of making that does so that this thing subsists as a thing? That's the question. And this question must be clear in your mind. The way I formulated it right now. Because if you, if you change the terms of the question, then you don't understand what Plotinus does. Is that clear? Uh, yes. All right. Then let's go to uh, the next question. Who was the, the other person who wanted to... It was me, I forgot to answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, no question. Ah, no question, okay. All right, so uh, let's do this, guys. Um, uh, we're gonna meet again on Thursday. Online, you find already the translation up to chapter four. Uh, tomorrow, I will go on translating, I hope, chapter four five and six, if I have time. Because in the meanwhile, I'm also revising the and then enlarging the commentary. So it's a bit uh, difficult. But in any case, you should find five and six uh, tomorrow already there. And uh, uh, on Thursday, we're going to focus on chapter three and four. Okay, because it is in chapter three and four that Plotinus uh, starts going into uh, an exposition of his own thesis. Now, one recommendation is that you read carefully my commentary on chapter three above all, okay? It's very, very important. Chapter three contains something crucial 
to understand the notion of theoria. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll see you on Thursday. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, bro. Bye. 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 Thank you, bro. Bye.